Joel's story. My name's Emily, I'm 31 years old and I was 30 when I was pregnant and gave birth to my baby boy Joel. I have three children, my fiancé James, Zach age 6, Louis age 4 and Mason age 2. All three of my boys were conceived within three months. I had healthy pregnancies with no concerns or health issues. I'm a healthy weight and I'm a very well person with no health concerns. We were excited to start trying for our baby number four to complete our family. We were lucky enough to conceive on the second month of trying. I'd been on taking my folic acid for the month before and through to the 12 weeks. Admittedly, this was missed from time to time, but I took it before I was pregnant, which is more than I did for my second and third babies. We went to our 12 week scan, there were no concerns, everything looked lovely and Joel's due date was confirmed as May the 17th, 2021. We then told the boys they were going to have a brother or sister and they were very excited. My pregnancy was good, at 16 weeks we heard Joel's heartbeat. Oddly it did take a long time to, uh, to find it which did make me really panic but we found it and heard his heart beating happily so we weren't concerned. Our 20 week scan was booked for the 21st of December but my fiancé James received a text to self-isolate from Track and Trace. I was going to attend the scan with my mum, but as it was only 19 weeks, I rang and I was able to reschedule when James could attend the week later. Our anomaly scan was rebooked for the 29th of December, and looking back, this was a godsend as I got to enjoy Christmas with the boys blissfully unaware that anything was wrong. We went to our scan. I'd had a bad feeling and had said I felt worried something was going to go wrong. I kept saying you can't have four healthy babies and no problems or miscarriages. I'm just worried something will go wrong. However, people assured me it was normal. I was just nervous because I was feeling a very active Joel. At our scan, the sonographer was very quiet and didn't say much until she confirmed her baby had an open spina bifida. Another lady was brought into the room to confirm the diagnosis. We didn't really get a chance to see our baby, but as she was scanning his lower back, we could clearly see he was a little boy. I was absolutely shell-shocked and terrified. We were taken to our family room to meet the specialist midwife and we were talked through getting an appointment in the next couple of days for a scan with fetal medicine in Bristol. From that moment we were shown Joel's spina bifida and we knew it was bad but we tried to remain positive until we knew for sure. Thankfully we didn't have to wait long and our scan was booked for the 31st of December just two days later. Whilst waiting for the appointment in Bristol, I spent the whole time researching obsessively everything I could about open spina bifida, what it was, how it happens, what it affects and potential outcomes. Those two days were so hard waiting to know the full diagnosis of the severity of Joel's condition. Every time I felt Joel move, it was bittersweet. I almost didn't want to feel him if I knew I was going to lose him. I broke down when the boys spoke to their brother and still wanted to touch my belly. After the longest two days of my life, we drove to St Michael's Hospital, Bristol. Sitting in the waiting room with lots of happy couples having their scans and coming out with scan pictures is extremely difficult. I found it so hard but I tried to just look around the room at nothing until we were called in. The scan was wonderful though. We had such a long time looking and seeing Joel. It was so clear. But sadly the prognosis was not good. We were informed that sadly Joel had a large sac on the outside of his spine which covered si five segments of his spine from L5 to S3 measuring 23 by 20 by 11 millimetres, and his spinal cord was visible within it. This is known as a, don't ask me how to say this, myelomeningocele spina bifida, and it's the most severe form. Joe was also showing signs of Arnold cherry malformation, a lemon-shaped head and a banana-shaped cerebellum, where pressure from the hole in his spine was pulling his brain down his neck. It was also clear that the amniotic fluid in the sac had been in contact with the nerves in Joel's spine as he had a severe bilateral talipes on both feet, also known as club feet. The sac was considered large on a tiny baby and we then discussed the risks in detail for Joel, including motor, sensory, orthopaedic problems such as difficulty walking, curvature of the spine, bladder, bowel and sexual dysfunction, to name a few. We explained he needed an operation in his first days of life to close his back an operation to repair his ankle joints and a VP shunt to drain excess fluid from his brain. The pressure on the brain could also cause learning difficulties and affect his personality. The consultant talked to us um, going through the options. Um, we could go ahead with the pregnancy and wait and see, although Joe's, Joel's spina bifida was so severe they didn't know how well this would go. We would qualify for in-the-room fetal surgery at Great Northern Street Hospital, but this would require relocating to London um, from the procedure which had to be done before 26 weeks until Joel had been born and had the initial treatment which with our three boys 
this would have been near impossible to manage. Finally, we were given the option to terminate the pregnancy. It was the clear route the consultant felt was best for Joel, but explained all our options fairly, allowing the decision to be ours alone. She urged us to consider the impact on our current lives and our three children, as Joel would be very poorly and be born needing a lot of care and throughout his life. Before going to this appointment, I'd done a lot of research into spina bifida, so nothing came as a surprise to me. It just reiterated just how severe Joel's condition was. Sadly, we knew that the right decision for us and the best decision for Joel was going to be to terminate the pregnancy. This is a decision we still stand by, despite being the hardest and most heartbreaking decision we've ever had to make. I honestly thought I'd fight for my baby, and I've always said that nothing would stop me having my baby. But seeing it in black and white changed this. Understanding how, just how badly Joel's quality of life would have been impacted and how this would impact on Zach, Louis and Mason's lives, there really wasn't another choice in my mind. We were booked in for a termination in two parts. On Saturday, the 2nd of, on Saturday the 2nd of January, we went in and I took the pill to terminate the pregnancy. And then I was admitted on Monday the 4th of January to be induced to give birth to Joel. The weekend of taking the pill was awful as I was worried Joel would suddenly stop moving and I'd know. But I felt a move as normal all weekend and only slowed down on the Monday morning. I was still feeling him though, so I wasn't sure if it had worked. In the space of a couple of days, I'd gone from not wanting to feel Joel before our scan in Bristol to again absolutely treasuring and holding on to every single moment and spending so much time holding and talking to my bump. On Monday, I had my first tablets at 10 at 10.15, inserted behind my cervix, and again at 2.15. The start was slow, but from 5pm it started becoming intense and the normal very painful contractions with labour. It was the most surreal experience. Your body just wants to give birth, which feels normal after giving birth to three babies. I had to keep reminding myself that Joel wasn't staying and that I had to say goodbye. I found the labour really tough. I'd given birth to my three boys naturally in a birthing pool where I felt comfortable. This was out of my comfort zone. Being induced to forcibly get Joel out and not in water, my natural pain relief. I was very... Uh, I was also very adamant I didn't want pain relief except gas and air. I was so worried if I had anything stronger that I would forget something. I didn't want it to be a blur. I wanted to remember every single moment of Joel's time in the world. Joel was born at 6.26, at 21 weeks weighing 11 ounces. The moment he came out, he let out a cry. The sound that I replay in my head over and over. My perfect little boy. He was alive and breathing on me for one hour and 44 minutes before taking his last breath on Daddy at 8.10pm. He was a miniature perfect little boy. His spina bifida was very clearly evident, but he was beyond beautiful like his brothers. We had the whole evening and next day with Joel, where he was with us always. We spent that time cuddling and kissing and making memories of him. A photographer came from Member My Baby Charity and took some photos of Joel meeting his brothers, Grandma and Nana. These photos are heartbreakingly beautiful, but I'm so glad I have them. We took so many photos of Joel and they honestly keep me going. On a daily basis, I go for my pictures and my only video of Joel alive and moving. And every time I relive holding my little boy, breathing on me, skin to skin on my chest. After, after Joel's birth was tough, I'd given birth so I was sore, tired, bleeding heavily, and I had no oomph after losing a litre of blood. My stomach ached and I felt hollow, completely empty. Then at the next days, your body continues as if you've had a baby and I had to enjoy my milk coming in and leaking away with no baby to feed. Breastfeeding is my most favourite thing about having a baby and the joy I get from feeding made this so hard. The two days that I was in hospital, we received the most wonderful care and support in the safe bubble they created for us. Looking back, I actually wasn't that emotional as I always had Joel with me. James and I just knew when the time was right to leave Joel. His body was deteriorating and we wanted to remember him before his body changed too much as he did when he was born. When the time came to leave the Joel in hospital, it was horrific. We gave him one last kiss and walked out leaving him in his cold cot. My heart hurt so much like I didn't know possible. And it's felt like that ever since. I could hardly breathe. I just wanted to scream as loud as I could. But we got in the car and drove to collect the boys. It was extremely hard having three children at home to care for. Particularly that first evening at home as we were both but numb and felt lifeless. We got through it and having the boys to love us was so helpful in giving us strength. I'm so glad we have our boys as they've given us the motivation to carry on. We had Joel's funeral service four weeks after his birth and he was cremated the same day. It was a beautiful service which I tried so hard to make perfect for our little boy. 
The day was impossibly hard and heartbreaking watching James carry the coffin of his little boy into the room. To see my rock and love of my life in bits holding back tears is an image I will never ever forget. My eldest son, Zach, who's six, also got so upset and couldn't stop crying at the end of the service. I wanted to take away his sadness instantly, but I couldn't do anything but cuddle and talk to him. Thankfully, children are resilient and bounce back quickly, as all of our boys have. We all certainly had some comfort from Joel's ashes coming home. The boys would ask to have Joel down to talk to or to hold the box with him. And on the first night, Joel was taken upstairs for the bedtime story. I will forever question how Joel would have been if we continued with the pregnancy, despite being confident we made the right choice for Joel. He was so strong holding on to meet Mummy and Daddy, which always makes me think, would he have been a miracle child and been okay? But we worked off the facts and made the hardest decision of our life. I'm still so, I'm still so sad and emotional about losing Joel. I have good days and bad days. I'm currently always in a mission to do something and keep my brain occupied, but it seems to be my way of coping and grieving. I try to get on with my life and be happy and be my happy self with my boys. We talk about Joel always and involve him in everyday life. We have already had signs that Joel is with us and will very much always be part of our family and our life. I want people to know that firstly, it happens. It just happens. We became the 0.06% chance of having a child with open spina bifida. Six babies out of 10,000 in the UK each year. We don't have any of the risk factors and it was just bad luck. It's not anything you've done. Sometimes no one is to blame and it is no one's fault. Secondly, just because you chose to end the pregnancy, that doesn't make it any easier or painless. I honestly felt I had no choice in the decision and it was the only option we had based on his diagnosis. Before I gave birth to Joel, I remember saying, I wish I had scan, his heart wasn't beating and I didn't have to choose. But I don't believe that anymore, as to have Joel alive with us was a magical experience and I feel blessed we were lucky enough to have. Thirdly, losing a child is tough, beyond words, but there's so much love and support out there to pull you through the dark days. It really made me appreciate people and how kind and generous human beings can be. I know I'll always have that pain of losing Joel and life is just different now, but I have the most amazing, supportive, loving partner and I'm forever grateful of my boys and my beautiful angel boy Joel. He will always be with me in my heart, wherever I go and whatever I do.